I think we've kept you waiting long enough at this stage. We bring out the star of the show. Yeah. We've produced a lot of good sports people in this country, quite a few great ones, but none greater than the number one on our good wall here. You know all his honours. Let's meet the man. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive second captain's welcome to Brian Great to have you here, first of all. Good to be here. She's oh, a sinker. Sorry, Brian. I'll just get this out of the way. <laughs> sorry, Brian. Some crazed fan probably brought that in. I don't know. We get weird at every show. This I week. don't think we've ever had a reception quite like that for anyone we've had in. So let's get straight into it. Everyone wants to hear about this. You're undisputed number one in the good wall. You have been for a hell of a long time. 21 of the biggest names in Irish sport have had their chance. Only one has had the gall to knock you off top spot. The unthinkable happened in the very first episode of the very first series. One more change for yep. the whole board. One one, trick all your gun. Ruthless by Ron O'Gara. And a difficult one for uh, Kieran Murphy here. Now, making the big call is one thing, I think, Brian, but relishing it to that extent is quite another. We can see a replay here. And if you have a look, this guy is taking an insane amount of pleasure in what he's doing. Is that the happiest you've ever seen Ron O'Gara look? <laughs> I've seen a few punts where he's been happy, all right, but not quite to that degree. Um, did you say the first episode of the first series? First episode of the very first series, he took you down. There must have been a few bob in the firm, was there? <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can make no comment. Uh, you, revenge might be in the offing tonight without giving too much away. You might think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you've, you're a full season retired, almost a full season retired now. We had Shane Horgan on the couch a, a year or so ago talking about he found it quite difficult supporting Ireland fully straight away. Now, his circumstances at the end of his career were a little bit different to yours. Have you found that difficult at all, going from being a player representing the team to cheering them on? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's difficult to be completely impartial and be... Because you feel as though there's a, uh, there is a possibility of you being part of that, you can't make the separation just yet. I probably need to get beyond the World Cup where I know I absolutely couldn't still have done it. Maybe there's, an, there's a piece of your, your, your brain that's telling you, oh, could you have maybe have gotten there? So once I get beyond that, I think I'll be able to relax a little bit more and support from a completely neutral point of view. But my support now is coming from a different place. Am I, uh, was I envious of the lads uh, for their Six Nations? Of course. Um, they could have maybe held off another year or so. Before yeah, did the decent <laughs> thing. You know, <laughs> um, you know um, I suppose a, a bit of your ego always wants to, you know, you want to be missed a little bit. Jared Payne came in and did a great job, took a, a, bit, of, a bit of stick for the first few games, but, you know, really showed his true colours in the last few matches. Um, and Robbie's been a revelation at 12 too. So um, it's, been, it's brilliant for Ireland. I think we're, we're in great shape. Um, Where did you watch the last game as a matter of interest? I watched it over my folks. Uh, my sisters and their kids were there and I had my kids. Um, I had my kids over with me, so yeah, it was. Um, we obviously didn't have any idea that we were going to get the day's rugby that we got, which was absolutely incredible. But it was, uh, it was kind of cool to do that with the folks. I never watch, I watched games with my folks and my sisters for 15 years, so nice to get to do it. Yeah, and I mean, you were you were invited to to celebrate. I I heard a couple of text messages gave the day after. Come on, meet us for a few pints. Is that kind of one of the situations where you're kind of glad you got the text, but you know. You know, I, I, can't, I can't go, but it's still kind of nice that they invited me. Yeah, it, the text didn't actually come from any of the lads. No. <laughs> the text came from Willie Bennett, our masseuse, that I'd uh, still be in a lot of contact with. And so Willie, he's in the doghouse now, Willie, for, even for inviting you. Willie'd be all-inclusive, so I just knew, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for me. You, know, you, have to let, you have to let things go. And as much as I was delighted for them and knew they'd have a good night, um, I had shitty nappies to clear up. <laughs> <laughs> you've moved, so when you're not doing that, you've, you're commentating on games, you've moved straight into punditry with News Talk and BT Sport. Were you tempted at all to take a clean break from the game from a year, for a year maybe and just totally forget about it? I don't know what I'd have done for a year. I think I'd have gotten, I'd, I'd have gotten antsy um, if, I, if I didn't get into something pretty soon. Um, and obviously the, the news talk thing uh, came up pretty quickly and I was two days retired and I had a, I had a new job, um, which was in a way is nice knowing that you can throw yourself into something. And then the BT stuff, the TV stuff, um, it, it was just, it, it's a real learning 
uh, curve, a steep learning curve. You know, you, you, there is a newfound respect for uh, some TV pundits <laughs> um, for you know for what they come up with for the for the sound bites, but quality sound bites as well. And um, I think you know that's where the likes of my friend Raj and, and Shane, I think, have really taken it to a new level uh, more recently because they're. They're interesting, but they're also very educated on the modern game. So, um, are they the guys you look up to? Is there any pundit from another sport or anyone either current or growing up watching that made you think a little bit differently? About I, I don't I, like on um, on Monday Night Football. I don't actually ever watch the games. I just watch the pre, halftime, and post game You're not analysis. Alone, you know? I think it's, it is, and that's revolutionary. Like it really is, and and the and the, the snippets you get on Twitter as well. If you miss the game, like the, the you know Carragher and, and Neville, are it's, it's enthralling and. Um, yeah, they, they again, from, from a soccer point of view, have, have kicked it to another level. Yeah, so what was it like for the first day? Like, the first day it was also happened to be Leinster Wasps, didn't it, with BT Sports? So there's kind of a lot going on there. What was that like being the, the new guy on the scene? I was actually quite relieved that it was my own team because, you know, some people think it's difficult to talk about your own team. You're very knowledgeable about individual players and way more than your your co-pundits. So you just need to choose what you can say. You just have you... to be a bit selective as to... As to as to how you say it, you know, there's, I've, I have learned that there's many ways to skin a cat and, and, you know, even when you're talking negatively about someone, you know, you can spin it in a way where, you know, that was a very uncharacteristic pass of Ian Madigan's or, you know, you, 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 you twist it slightly where it doesn't sound quite as bad. By the way, Mads passing is phenomenal. So <laughs> obviously that was just an example. But um, yeah, so it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's difficult to do, particularly when, you know, you're friends with a lot of these guys and you don't want to, um, you don't want to get a text the next day going, I, I saw the punditry, explain, question mark. <laughs> Gary Neville, you mentioned there, uh, uh, he did a very interesting interview lately where he talked about how his philosophy, the way he thinks about football, he said, has changed totally. He was in a Manchester United dressing room for years, thought as a footballer and thought as a Manchester United footballer, made a conscious decision that he didn't want to coach, he wanted to go, wanted to go into punditry to experience it in a different way. And he says he sees everything very differently now. I suppose you're only in the first year of it, but is there a process there where you're starting to look at things in a different way in your sport? Yeah, I, and I think the process definitely, I, I, the first six or seven weekends that I was involved, I was still really finding my feet, understanding what my voice was. And then the more you distance yourself from the team, um, I think the more honest you can be. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult because, for instance, the Toulon Leinster game, I, I said, you know, I just don't see how Toulon are going to be beaten. And I, I, you know, I was glad that Leinster pushed them as much. I'm still a huge Leinster fan, but yet you have to have a credibility about what you're saying too. If you g genuinely believe something, just because you've left the team 10 or 11 months ago, you can't let that cloud your judgment. And so that's why I'm trying to, in my new role, gain a credibility for what I think. And do you know what? Sometimes I'm going to be wrong. And I'm okay, I would have been okay with that being wrong if Leinster had pushed through <laughs> in the semi-final. How competitive are you about it? Because you've talked about your competitive instincts and streak in sport. As a pundit, are you looking at other guys and thinking, I want to get to their level, I want to get higher? Is that the way it works? Yeah, I think you look at guys and you think there's a real, there's an excellent flow to what they're saying. Um, and you know, I would never ever say it to them, but in, in my role, as, particularly as co-commentator, not, not pundit, but co-commentary, which is another art again, um, someone like Austin Healy is phenomenal at it. Now, Austin's at it seven or eight years, but he, is, he really does have it, have it down. And only, I'm only saying this because it's an Irish show and there's no chance of him ever hearing it. Um, but on he on is, English TV, you talk about boxing around in, online stores, I think. Mm, but he, um, he's, uh, he's very, very good. And again, it's just the balance of educating the, the people at home and giving a little bit of insider knowledge and you know a, a lot of the stuff like yourselves it's all about doing the research and I still can't believe that that Ericsson phone you had a you, had <laughs> <laughs> that, but, it you remember it well there, Brian okay, it was <laughs> that's how deep the research was <laughs> <laughs> the can you take us way back to even before your Irish career started or around that time I mean, you grew up like the rest, rest of us watching an Irish rugby team that wasn't successful and didn't think there was any reason they were supposed to be particularly successful. How did you get the idea in your head at an early stage that we can actually be a really good team and we can beat the best in the world? I think that evolves. I think the group of players that I came through with, um, probably I was maybe the, the first of that breed to, to get capped in 99. And then when 
um, when all the guys like Shane and Raj and Strings, Hayes and Simon Easterby all got capped against Scotland in 2000, I think that it kind of, it was, it was a um, new blood that were used to winning at schools level and under 21s level and we kind of thought, why shouldn't that happen those at senior level? Those early caps though, those early caps were, you know, you were there for lawns, you were there at Twickenham on a particularly bad day. It seems amazing that it could be so sudden. In your own head, when you, after you've had your first cap for Ireland, are you immediately thinking, well, these other young guys are around and we're going to be able to come through together? Is there any doubt in your mind that you're going to be a successful international rugby? You're just happy to be there initially for the first seven or eight caps, particularly got through the World Cup. I wasn't, I never anticipated being involved in that 99 World Cup. You get into it and to be able to enjoy the moment uh, was fantastic, but then it was a you know, pretty negative outcome. And then very quickly you get not that you get used to playing in a green jersey, but you get bored of losing in a green jersey and then the need for, um, for success comes and that you know, obviously tied in nicely with, that, with the, that group of players coming through. The cliche, Brian, is that everybody is a leader. It doesn't matter who's wearing the armband. We hear that in every sport, but you captained Ireland 83 times and a lot of people, if they played 83 times for their country, it's an achievement in itself. So it's phenomenal that you captain them that often. It always strikes me anytime you talk about the captaincy as it was happening and even since then, reading your book and all of that, it mattered a hell of a lot to you, captaining Ireland. Yeah, it was, it was an enormous honour, yeah, of course. I never, I never took it for granted and I thought a time would come where I'd be able to give it up myself and I, I hoped that time would come, but it never did. And then when eventually it was passed on to Jamie Heaslip, I was, I was hurt and disappointed because I still wanted to be captain of Ireland because it was such a huge honour to lead the team out and to be able to um, try and, and, and try and be a, lead, uh, a senior player and a leader, one of many, you know, captaincy, a bit too much is sometimes made of it at times. Uh, it's definitely a core of, of, of leaders, senior players in that team, um, in any team, makes it successful rather than just one voice. Your first time as captain was against Australia in 2002, which was a bit of a surprise to you, I think. Yeah, as, as in you, hadn't, you weren't captain Leinster, you hadn't really captained teams that much on the way up. Was it a surprise to the more senior players or were you concerned about how they were going to react? Absolutely. <laughs> it was a total surprise to me. Keith Wood came. It was strangely, Eddie O'Sullivan got Keith Wood to come and ask me whether I'd be interested. Of course, um, I jumped at the opportunity and then I thought to myself, like, how am I meant to captain you know, these guys with... Um, kids and mortgages and stuff, really kind of grown up stuff. So um, I just, I then quickly realized that I couldn't do it Keith's way or anyone else's way, I had to do it my own way. And what came naturally was trying to, was the leadership on the pitch, what probably wasn't as natural as being a good orator off the pitch. And, but that, you know, I'd like to think came with time, you know, probably took me a little bit longer than I would have liked. Yeah, the, the first ever uh, post-match banquet speech uh, <laughs> didn't go well by all accounts you called it uh, brutal I think was the word you, you went yeah, for yeah it was a horror show um, yeah because I was given it to I was given my speech by the uh, by the PR team and um, I don't know I didn't have great eyesight at the time so the, the milk bottle glasses went <laughs> on and you know when you read a speech you have to nail it you know um, but I, I read it like it was my second or third language. Um, <laughs> and um, I just remember being halfway through, and you know when you know halfway through this is going disastrously and there's still half a page to go. <laughs> it's a nightmare. So um, yeah, finished it and then went back to the table and I got a few tokens. Oh, well done, that was really good, which was even more humiliating. <laughs> you know those ones. I don't need your sympathy. No, exactly. So I just, I said to myself, I can never do that again. I can never read someone else's speech. So I always wrote my own one and it was never, you know, um, it was ne never ri written line for line. I, I kind of just jotted a few points and, and winged it a bit. You've talked about the captaincy, the pressure in the past of representing the team in a certain way and having to speak in a certain way publicly because you are the captain of your country. Are you glad that part of it is gone? Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you, there's a protection that comes with being part of a team, but also um, a necessity to adhere to the philosophies and the thoughts of what the team, you know, the message the team is trying to portray. So when you, are an individual as I am now, yeah, you, you, 
it, there, there's dangers lie with it too because everything you say is just your voice and you have nothing to protect you. But also it gives you, it's liberating as well to be able to speak your mind. It sounds like it's all good around the retirement. I mean, you have some sports people and they're uh, crying their eyes out practically over trying to find a new identity, having considered themselves as one thing, largely one thing for many years. Is there any dark side to to this past year for you? Um, yeah, I think you do miss it. You absolutely miss it. Um, like all the other things that I'm doing, that like I'm, I'm enjoying a lot of the stuff. Um, but at the same time, everything you do is a poor second to playing. Playing is the ultimate. And a time comes when, you, you, thankfully for me, I was able to call it on, on my own terms. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I would have loved to have kept going but the body wouldn't, wouldn't do that anymore. Has there so been you, one moment? Has there been a moment in the year where, you re, where it actually hurt, physically hurts or it hurts you inside that you're not still playing? No, I, I think, listen, I, I don't miss the training. I don't miss, I can't punish myself in, in the gym anymore. I just, I, I think I, I empty the tank with that. And so, you know, I'd love to have been in Edinburgh lifting the trophy with the lads, but I just wasn't willing to do the hard yards. <laughs> and they don't tie together anymore. So you, you, um, you look at those moments with an element of envy, but it's hard to feel hard done by as well, being able to finish the way I did with the Six Nations last year too. So. Right, well, I think it's just about time to get up and knock Ron O'Gara off the good wall. I think <laughs> Brian O'Driscoll, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Stand up. You head over there and tell us how it's looking. We'll just stand here, Brian. Just back here, perfect. Thanks. Top tender. Okay, number 10 is uh, Ronan O'Gara, uh, Rory McIlroy 9, Paul McGrath 8, George Bestie 7, AP McCoy. Top 5 then is Katie Taylor, uh, Paul Jack Harrington, Paul O'Connell, Henry Shefflin, and the man gathering dust at the top of our good wall, <laughs> Brian O'Driscoll. All right, number one question is, who are you bringing in? Uh, it's a really, really tricky one because you look at the great names, and I know that Robbie Keane hasn't been there an awful lot. You know, goal scorer for Ireland the way uh, he has been for... You know, 16, 17 years is phenomenal. Um, but I'm keeping it Irish and I'm going to go with Gooch. Um, right, Colin Cooper. <laughs> Pretty popular. What is it about the Gooch? Cooper. I think just I've always been a big fan of, I've, uh, you know, the physically probably um, not the specimen that some other players are, but the, 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 the guile and, and you know, the, the cunning and guile of him is phenomenal. Um, and, you know, he's two feet that anyone would die for. So, you know, okay. he's, uh, he's my guy. I don't know if I even need to ask this question. Who's coming off the wall? <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? Don't get shy now. <laughs> don't back um, out at the last minute. You couldn't take anyone else off that wall, except maybe your man at the top, but Raj has got to go. Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair. Let's roll an Aragon. You can make one before change. One more switch that you want to do with the wall there. Right. Yeah, again, you know, from the Irish perspective, it's, it would be, for me, number one um, is a really tight call, probably between two guys, um, between King Henry and Porig, but just from an international perspective, I've got to put Porig up to number one. And ah. that means Brian O'Driscoll down to number four. Very humble there, Brian, I must say, but that's fair enough. You're, you're obviously a big Porig fan. <sighs> yeah, listen, it, there's nothing... What's not to like about yeah. Porig Harrington? He's a three-time major winner, and I think it said it all when he won earlier this year, the popularity and, and how much the, the country was rooting for him. That's so that really says it all. Good enough reasoning. Brian O'Driscoll, everybody! You can take a seat there, Brian. But there is one show to which we return time and time again. Rapid, the turn of the Millennium Kids sports show presented by Jason Sherlock, is a veritable treasure trove of Irish sporting superstars feeling their way into the crazy world of show business. But in this, the final show of the series, I will now present the greatest rapid archive we've ever uncovered. Uh, no, it's not Dervil O'Rourke and her massive purple tracksuit. No, not her. Uh, it's not the time J.O. called around to a young Bernard Dunn's house for a spot of breakfast and then, suitably refreshed, went for the slowest jog we've ever seen. Seriously, lads, you're not going to win any world title like that. It's not even the time a young Brian O'Driscoll aggressively coached some teenagers and showed them who was boss when it came to tackling. Uh, so there we go. That's a little over the top, actually, Brian. Right? Yeah. Well, actually, who here wants to see Brian's presenting skills from back in the day? Anyone? Oh, yeah. Go on, go on. Good technique there. 
How you doing? I'm Brian O'Driscoll, and over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show you some rugby skills that are going to hopefully improve your game. <laughs> Firstly, we're going to start with tackling. Uh, basically, there's, uh, there's two types of tackle you can have. Um, you can have the front-on tackle and, the, uh, and the, the side tackle. Front tackle and side tackle. If BT Sport were around back then, surely the call would have come even sooner. But without that, this is the highlight, ladies and gentlemen. This is when Rory met Philip, staring Irish Ryder Cup legend Philip Walton and a young man by the name of Rory McIlroy. So uh, there he is. He's got all the proper gear, all right. The little wraparound shades, the tiny Nike Peak cap, gloves, and of course, this mini golf club. Let's all look at this mini golf club. This week's Here's Rapid Jill. Challenge involves a Ryder Cup winner, Philip Walton, and a world champion, Rory McIlroy. Rory, you won the under 10s World Championships in Miami this year? Yes. That must have been amazing. Yes, it was. And Philip, do you still have fond memories about the Ryder Cup? I sure do, yeah. It happened in America as well. So. Yeah, you'll have a tough challenge this morning. I'm looking forward to it now. He's. Uh, He's a good little player and I'm going to give him four shots over three holes. Jesus Christ, fella, four shots, he's nine! <laughs> On the other hand, that swing by Rory is about the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, so it might be fair enough. It's true what they say, you've got to be up early to get one past Philip Walton, the crafty old devil. Uh, so here Rory casts a critical eye over Philip's swing. Yeah, good shot, Philip. I'm about to kick. Mm. Yeah, it was a good shot by Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Bad kicks, that morning water, you're playing a nine-year-old. Is it just me, or is it freaky how someone this small can be this good at golf? I don't know, but this is it. Uh, oh, Philip Walton. Uh, there we go. A grown-ass man, lest we forget, Philip Walton <laughs> has this putt for a win on the final green. Watch how Rory surveys the action in the background, cleverly reading Philip's line, showing all the killer instincts of a future world number one. So here goes Philip. He uh, puts but he leaves it short. So our plucky young northern hero has a chance to tie the match. Behind those super cool wraparounds burn the eyes of a future major champion. Come on, so here we go. And he gets it! Joy X across that new face here is a high five from Gail and some words of wisdom from Irish golf, legend of the links. Yeah. Nice stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. Right, so yeah. what do you think, Philip? I think he's got a great swing. Come in there. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Don't change anything. And you're going to grow into a big fella and a great golfer. Ah, uh, how, how prophetic those words would prove to be. <laughs> Although at the time, Rory doesn't really seem like he gives much of a shit. But if a Ryder Cup player couldn't beat him, how the hell could the under 10s around the world stand a chance? Although I reckon this young Jimmy Tarbuck impersonator might have fancied his chances. Uh, nice tartan pants there, Drickel, in the middle. Uh, so a round of applause, please, for Jason Sherlock, nine-year-old nine -year Rory McIlroy and Philip Walton.